And the very first speaker um, is somebody uh, that many of you, if you don't already know, I'm sure will get to know uh, very well. And this is the Right Honorable Lord Way of Shoreditch. Um, he's a social entrepreneur who's interested in social reform. He's the youngest member of the House of Lords of the UK Parliament, and he's the only active ethnic Chinese member of it. He graduated from Oxford, worked at McKinsey, um, and did a number of uh, high-profile jobs, including working on the big society uh, for this current government. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Lord Wei to give our first keynote speech. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor to uh, be with you all here today. And uh, to, be, to be perfectly honest, even a few years ago, I would never have imagined that I would have the opportunity to come here with such distinguished, uh, uh, sort of an, uh, such a distinguished audience. And um, my connection with China uh, goes back quite considerable time. My grandfather was from a village in China called Zhongshan, which is in Guangdong province. Uh, there's a, a famous politician, in fact, the first president of China, Sun, Sun Yat-sen, Sun Jun sen actually came from a village next to my grandfather's, who then moved to Hong Kong, and then my father moved here to the UK. And growing up here in Britain, it never occurred to me that one day China would be such a huge phenomenon as it is today. Nor did it occur to me that as a young uh, Chinese, I'd have the opportunity to go and work in Parliament, in the Lords, uh, where I now have the privilege of trying to help build bridges between the uh, East and West uh, in Parliament through parliamentary groups uh, that I'm involved in and also in training up young people. So it's a great honor to be with you here and it's a great honor to be with you here at LBS which I have had the privilege of uh, being a frequent visitor to over the last decade or so and I have observed that the LBS is indeed uh, often and always at the forefront of new developments uh, and therefore I want to applaud the China Forum today, especially for putting together this wonderful event, this meeting of minds. And I know that your topics today span investment, innovation, sustainable growth, and branding. And I want to talk about something that's very much in line with these themes, a subject that is dear to my heart, which I have called the, the Chinese dream. As we all know, we stand at a crossroads in the development of China and in the development of the relationship between East and West. Indeed, we are at a crossroads in our understanding in the West of China's reemergence. And in many ways, having looked at this topic uh, for quite a while, I believe that the era we are in right now has many parallels with Britain's dilemma in the mid 18th century. If you think about where Britain was in the early, say, Victorian period, a massive uh, industrial revolution had just taken place. Huge numbers of people from the countryside were entering uh, British cities, and this was paralleled in many other Western countries. We had a rising middle class for the first time. But we also had huge inequalities and social and environmental pressures that came from that. The establishment was worried about the threat of war and particularly civil unrest, civil calamity, as they had seen in the previous uh, century in France and in Europe. Which, and it was a constant source of anxiety for the ruling body politic of the time. And yet, over a hundred years later, Britain in particular has survived without this bloody unrest uh, somehow. Of course, there are many great differences between Europe and China, between East and West, in terms of civilization, history, scale, and culture. And yet I think if sometimes we understood our own history a little in the West and where we came from and how long it took to get to where we are today, we might better understand the challenges and opportunities that also come with China's rise and wonder and marvel at how fast it has developed over the last 30 years, even to get to this point today. Key to the development of Britain from uh, that moment, a moment not dissimilar to today's for China, were several important factors. The first was a rise in philanthropic reformers, people who saw the social and environmental and economic challenges and thought, I can do something about that, whether through my business or through 
through charity, through creating chains of schools and all kinds of initiatives. Secondly, there was an emergence of enlightened thinkers in government who sought to involve people more very gradually in decision making over time. And thirdly, there was a class of business leaders, often I note the second generation, who saw their role as about more than just making money, but also about stewarding resources for the next generation, for those even yet to be born. Leaders such as, uh, in Britain, George Cadbury or John Lewis. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, George Cadbury <coughs> was a, uh, his father originally started selling tea in Britain and eventually started to sell chocolate in his shop. And it was very popular, uh, both as a drink and as, as food. And eventually, he ended up being very successful in selling up lots of factories. And George was the classic entrepreneur, and there are many Chinese, I think, would would be like that, from literally owning one shop or being in the village to suddenly presiding over a massive multi-billion dollar empire within a, a matter of decades or even one decade. His son, however, uh, George Cadbury, decided that actually we also need to look at workers because their productivity ultimately is what's going to sustain the business. And in fact, he created an entire city. And those of you who ever get a chance to go and visit Bourneville, uh, which is sort of the city that's sort of around Cadbury, you can see the, the, the work that was done to create housing, to create clubs and associations and sports and all kinds of amenities for employees. I recently met a, uh, a, a billionaire entrepreneur who, from China and uh, who's been very, very successful lately. And, he sa and I asked him, what is it that made you successful? He said, well, when I took over the business, I saw that the employees weren't getting paid that much, so he doubled their wages and the productivity in increased massively and the profits surged. Now that might not work for every business, but that is perhaps as an example of a modern day Chinese Cadbury. Or what about Sped and Lewis? We have a, a very famous uh, uh, department store here called John Lewis. I think many maybe probably have shops there. Um, the founder of John Lewis, John Lewis himself, was a cutthroat businessman, a real entrepreneur. He kind of built the business from scratch. And his son, Sped and Lewis, uh, once had an accident and spent an entire year in hospital thinking, da thinking dangerous thoughts. And he realized that his family got 99% of the profits of, that, of John Lewis, uh, which you know, wasn't always that profitable, whilst only 1% went to the employees through their wages. And he decided quite radically to design a model, which we now know as a John Lewis partnership model, to combine the best of private limited companies with the best of mutualism and cooperative movements, effectively to create an employee-owned partnership where the employees had the majority stake. And so when he, as he died or as he retired, he handed over control to those employees. And, it's, and this business is still around today, and they regularly, pretty much every year, pay out bonuses to, uh, uh, I think, over 100,000 staff now. Uh, and recently, the government in Britain has, has seen that as potentially a model to tackle inequality, not less capitalism, but more capitalism, more democratic capitalism, enabling more people to share in the benefits of business growth. These, these business people weren't just thinking about what we call CSR, a, a side activity to their business. They were saying, what is it in the DNA of my business uh, that can allow us to tackle some of the major problems in our society and enable business to outlast even me and my, and my life and my children's lives? This group of individuals and others came together to create what I call the British dream. Some call it Victoriana. Every rising power over the last four or five centuries has created a, a dream, a commercial dream, to express what they're about. There's the European dream, the British dream, the American dream, and now the Chinese dream. And these dreams, to paraphrase uh, Sun Yat-sen again, the first president of China, often revolved around simple everyday products and services as a means to communicate globally the values of their culture, of their country. Sun Yat-sen said once that all Chinese need to have clothing, transportation, food and drink, and housing. And so too these dreams uh, involve uh, food and drink and housing. Think of Levi's, think of Coca-Cola, think of Savile Row suits, Rolls Royce. These elements that the world over knows, knows and understands and they each convey uh, the values of those cultures. So through the American dream we learn about freedom and consumerism. Through the British dream, we learn about uh, society 
and, uh, and, and politeness. And many today are asking, what, what's gonna, what will be the Chinese dream? What are the values that it will convey? Will it speak of the importance of family, of perhaps harmony with nature, of curiosity and learning, values which are ancient in China and have resonance, I think, in the West? Or will it be a replaying of the old Chinese dream? Uh, people now in China talk of guo hui, the need to go back hundreds of years to recover what is it that made China great, given that we can't learn any more from the Americans or the Europeans, perhaps, in quite the same way. I think just to focus on China's past, whilst it has real benefits, also has weaknesses. Uh, a relentless focus on copying the classics perhaps is what led to China not perhaps innovating. You've been talking about innovation this morning to the extent that it could do. Not inventing the light bulb, not inventing the internet. Or will the dream perhaps continue to be the American dream with a Chinese face that we can see in contemporary China? Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere, the focus on luxury, four by four cars, with all the environmental challenges that that might bring. Of course, China is big enough and complex enough. All of these different dreams, the European, the British, the American, the old Chinese dream can all often coexist alongside each other. But I think in the absence of a clear narrative for the 21st century, I fear in the West at least, that people might point instead to a Chinese nightmare. An understanding of China which only reflects one facet of its complex reality. And certainly that is the media image in the West. We, as we talk about business, cross-border investment, the need to build brands, the need to protect IP, I think behind all of these is a Chinese nightmare. Not yet the full trust that we need that might come about if there was such a thing as a Chinese dream. What if, in the coming decades, great Chinese companies, as including those that are in this room and beyond, start to invent new kinds of clothing that are good for the environment and perhaps wearable, using wearable technology, or drinks that are healthy and good for your body, don't just fill you with caffeine but give you a sense of peace, or new forms of communications, perhaps using telepresence. They would have to work with the West to combine the innovation with some of these Chinese values uh, but which you know, are good for the environment and good for community and families. Maybe this is just purely a dream, but I do believe that with the Chinese diaspora, with Western innovators and companies, with the great entrepreneurs that are now there in China, if enough people got together and said, we want to make this happen, then it is possible that we can create a Chinese dream. Just as in America, uh, Cadillacs, Levi's and so on, Coca-Cola became a great beacon to help people understand American culture. Products that may come over the coming years could convey something about China and Chinese culture um, that we don't quite yet grasp always in the West. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to paper over or ignore the harsh realities that exist today in China and the challenges of working between East and West. But I'm also saying there are positives too, and if we can build on them and use them to facilitate trust building, innovation, creativity in addressing social and business pro problems, and to create confidence in brands working across both East and West, we can move further together uh, in a far better way than if we didn't. This dream is ultimately a global dream, one which, just as tea, was sold in Britain that made all, all around the world, or just as the American space race, part of the American dream, involved European scientists, this Chinese dream could also involve East and West working together, harnessing talent, finance, and skills needed to make it a reality. In closing, it's a great honor to be here with you today among some of China's greatest contemporary entrepreneurs and some of the finest minds from both East and West. Again, Sun Yat-sen and many around him 100 years ago felt that it was through business that we could save China and that entrepreneurship and not just government and civilization would help her regain the growth, self-confidence and unity that she lacked. Today, at a time when the world lacks growth, is fraught with anxiety and increasingly fragmented and sometimes flirting with protectionism, I believe it is once again entrepreneurship that provides the answer, not just for China, but also for the world. Thank you.